All right, I'm Katie Culver and I'm back with another Media Law Chat. So I'm here with Kyla Wagner. Kyla, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, where you're from, and what case you decided to talk about today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to do this. Um, so um, my name is Kyla Garrett Wagner. I am an assistant professor at the Newhouse School of Public Communications at Syracuse University. Um, and I have the privilege of getting to teach communication law to advertising, public relations, and graduate students at Newhouse. Excellent. And today I'm going to be talking about FCC versus Pacifica, one of my all-time favorite uh, Supreme Court cases. Yep, it's it's one of my favorites to read. Students are often like, wait, is this really in this decision? <laughs> They wrote what? He said what? Uh, so <laughs> yeah, it's, it's such a fun one. So um, so let's start out talking about um, you know why this case is so fascinating. Why why is it something that you think everybody should know about? Absolutely. So thinking about the case specifically, just not even considering the historical context and the significance even plays today. If we were to just look at that one case itself, um, I think it is an excellent demonstration of the Supreme Court trying to answer a question it does not know how to answer. Um, and you can even kind of see some internal debate in its, its a majority opinion and in some of the concurring opinions. Um, but this is such a significant case because it has to do with the big question of, well, what do we do about the speech that makes people go like this and they don't want to see it and they don't want to hear it and they don't want to speak it. Um, and so FCC versus Pacifica gives us this arguably direct answer from the Supreme Court that says, okay, indecent content on broadcast media, whether that be radio or television, the FCC has the power to essentially address that issue and be the policing power for it. Um, and it uses this great example from uh, George Carlin's Seven Dirty Words, which if you don't know the Seven Dirty Words, I'm not gonna say them here, but I definitely recommend you watch that stand up because George Carlin is a genius. Um, but he essentially paints this picture that says we have more words to describe the dirty words that are out there and what are those dirty words and what kind of trouble can we get in for those dirty words those are the same questions the supreme court has asked in this and they're like oh i don't even want to figure out what that is but i can tell you we're going to give power to the fcc to figure out what that is and punish anybody who does do those things because we're trying to find this compromise do we protect children? Do we protect adults? Do we protect the rights of adults to access this content, but also the adults who don't want to access this content? And ultimately we get this decision from the Supreme Court that says, you know what? No, we're just, we're just going to say no to this. I don't know what this really is, but we're going to let the FCC figure it out. And we're going to decide that because of who could be in the audience when this type of content or speech is being said and how it's being said, meaning the medium of communication, those things are really significant. And for those reasons, we can decide that for certain times in the day, because of people in the audience, we can regulate and punish this kind of content. So that case is really significant. Um, I always like to say to my students that the who, what, where, when of free speech is a major driving force of your First Amendment rights. And this case very clearly points that out. Um, while at the same time answers the question, but doesn't answer the question as to what is indecent content and we have to give it some First Amendment protection, but I don't really know what it is and it isn't. And I know it's not obscene, but I know it's not political speech. So <laughs> yes and no, it gets rights. And because of this and when this and there, how, what, sure, whatever. Um, and so I, I think it really paints that clear, uh, an excellent picture of how the Supreme Court's trying to struggle to say, we want to give it rights, but we know this is something that can upset people. So how do we put some rules and regulations in place to find a compromise between all the needs and rights of citizens in the United States. Yeah, you know, it's it's such an interesting thing. I, I've always struggled with this with, with the Pacifica case because Carlin's speech was political speech, right? Like yes. he was, I mean, he was constantly, like this is, it is an attack on sort of the sensorial power of government. And yet the yeah. court doesn't frame it that way at all. Like it just completely glosses over that yeah. idea. It's it's always always been fascinating to me. What do you think people get wrong about this case? Like what gets misunderstood about it? Well, I think actually your point to the political speech element there is a big part of it because the Supreme Court even acknowledges in its decision that had these words or this this 
quote unquote stand up by Carlin not had been stand up, had it been something more like a political speech context, arguably the words would have been protected. And if we think back to some of the other cases that have to deal with offensive speech, like Cohen v. California, we have the Supreme Court saying things like, you know what, just because some things might offend people doesn't mean we can't protect them. Well, so the decision from Pacifica almost seems completely counterintuitive to that original decision, which was decided about the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's interesting that political speech element, had Carlin been saying this at the DNC or the RNC as stand up to get the crowd motivated to go out and vote or something, maybe would his words have been protected? Are you saying that if maybe our political leaders get up and do the same kind of thing to rally voters to go to the voting booth. Does that mean those words will be protected? Um, and so I, I think it points to this, again, that controversy, this struggle between the Supreme Court saying, well, maybe if this had been political, we wouldn't have been punishing it. It's like, well, I don't know if that's really true. And if it is true, then isn't it your interpretation that exactly this stand-up wasn't political because George Carlin was famous for his political satire um, and essentially poking fun at our government officials and, as he very rightly puts, our um, unclear laws. And so it's interesting that even the Supreme Court makes this decision about indecency with a speech that speaks to the government's inability to figure out even what is indecent or not. So I think that's a big part of what we don't get recognized that the, even the Supreme Court didn't note there is, there is actually this discussion of how this type of speech could have been political and thus would have been protected. It's just based on this interpretation that for whatever reason, this comedy skit, which was broadcast in the middle afternoon, wasn't considered political. And I finally, I, I find that kind of interesting and possibly wrong if I can go there. <laughs> Yeah, if you if you were a justice, what would you are? If I was a justice. If I was a justice, I'd be running for the hills. Let me tell you. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so uh, one of the things that students really bump on with this case is, you know, the the lengths the court goes to 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 differentiate broadcast media from at the time print media, but where they bump is today's context of online media, and this idea that. Mm -hmm one of the ways that we differentiate broadcast is that it's uniquely invasive. Like you, you know, it comes into your home and your kids get at it. Um, and, and they say, well, wait a minute. So why wasn't that, why didn't that hold sway in the Reno case? Because, you know, the internet is 10,000 times more invasive in your life than television today. So how do you answer that question? I really, I, I gotta admit, I fumbled the ball on that question because you, it's true for them in their lives, they rarely turn on the TV, but they can't escape the internet. Absolutely, and it, it's an excellent question. And I think actually it's a good segue into the kind of this idea is if we were to reconsider Pacifica today, mm -hmm. would we get the same decision? And actually if we, um, kind of jump ahead to FCC versus Fox, the 2012 Supreme Court decision, we actually have a concurring opinion from Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg that says, I don't think Pacifica was right. We need to reconsider it. Um, but if our Supreme Court justices ever decide to retire, I think they'll have a career in the NFL um, because they love to punt the question. Um, they'd make great kickers. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, we that, that uh, Fox versus FCC, we've had that case actually come up a couple of times now, happened in 2010 and again in 2012. And each time the Supreme Court has kind of punt this question about what is indecency and can we be regulating it? And I think that's all because of exactly what your students are pointing to, is this idea of medium of expression and broadcast content, it's just probably not relevant anymore. Um, we still have access to broadcast content, but it's even a cable-based broadcast type of content. Right. Um, perhaps maybe the thing that stayed the closest to the same is radio, but how many of us are now getting radio through internet connections as well? Mm -hmm. um, and exactly. so I think that, Exactly. I, essentially, the internet is like electricity for us at this point. I mean, it, it's on constantly. I think the time we're living through right now is a strong indicator of that. Our televisions are on, but that's dependent for many of us on internet connections. My cell phone connections are dependent on the internet. Um, so I think medium of expression is still a very significant part of First Amendment law, even today. And that's especially true of obscenity and indecency law. Um, but the big question is, is, is that even relevant anymore? Um, and probably not. And that for that reason, too, we might need to consider opening the freedoms, if you will, 
Um, this idea that we could keep penalizing indecent content on broadcast media just doesn't seem relevant anymore just because of all those significant changes and for no simple reason that no offense to my broadcasters <laughs> but it's just not as prevalent and to that end too the technology has significantly improved in 1978 when the supreme court made this decision parents had little to no control over the type of content their children got access to with the exception of the time when children could be listening essentially you got your tv guide and your programming list that told you when things are being played and so you just hope to not have the tv on at that time or maybe you had a list of shows your children couldn't watch that they gave to the babysitter but now between parental controls and technology on cell phones and whatnot this question about oh do we need to worry that people are being inundated with content doesn't seem to be as relevant anymore despite the fact that yes we still feel kind of accosted by information um, and there's still this idea that we don't have as much control. We're not the ones in the room making the programming list. But in theory, we have a lot more control now than we did in 1978. So some of those concerns that the Supreme Court based its decision on, this whole idea, like, I'm being accosted by broadcast media and, oh, I just can't turn it off. In some ways, that's true. And in some ways, that's not true anymore. And because of all these technological advances, that concern probably isn't there anywhere as much as at least it was almost 40 years ago. Yeah, and to, to, in today's environment, not just with, you know, the, the makeup of the court today and how that would go, mm -hmm. but just with the FCC's move, um, you know, we're in a deregulatory phase um, with the current administration and the FCC's move away, you know, trying to, to, trying to get out of this business. Have they backed away from indecency actions? You know, are we seeing less of that kind of control? Does it, you know, fit with the overall deregulation or is that really much more about ownership now, do you think? You know, if you had asked me before the 2020 Super Bowl um, <laughs> halftime show, then my answer would probably be different. <laughs> um, I, it's interesting. Well, I still see that the, and maybe this is a bad comparison, but the FCC kind of feels like mommy and daddy to me after the times. We still have this ability to run them to them and say, I don't like something that upset me. Oh, you should do something about it. But really, is the FCC turning around and grounding anybody anymore or taking away their allowance? I don't see that as much anymore. And I would definitely say, speaking to that point of the ownership element, I think we're seeing a lot more industry power, like the individual networks are deciding what words they will and will not use. Um, I can very vividly think to um, a particular dirty word our uh, executive leader used in the past couple of years to describe third world countries. And you saw a lot of different approaches to whether or not that word was explicitly used or if they used like a bleeped out version or whatnot. And I think that wasn't necessarily just because of what the FCC may or may not have done in terms of punishing those broadcasters if they had used the actual bad word, but it also just came down to what was the preference of that broadcaster? What did they perceive as their audience's preference? Um, and so just kind of on that note, I think when, when we look back to 1978, the Supreme Court at that time was really trying to establish what were these rights and who was going to be in control. Um, and I think that's actually the big takeaway of FCC. I think versus Pacifica, we focus it so much on the indecency part of it. Oh, it helps establish those rules. And I think really it's just the Supreme Court trying to say, uh, you're in charge of this. I don't know what it means, but you've got to figure it out. And now, even over 40 years since that decision, the poor FCC has never really been able to get a clear definition. What is obscene? What is indecent? It's changed. And I think that's one of those big things that students sometimes might not realize um, was part of this decision in 78 is so in 1969, we got a switch. We went from the Warren Court to the Burger Court. And so we talk about what the Supreme Court today would look like, thinking back to what it looked like in 1978. And there were actually a lot of obscenity and indecency cases within like a five-year time frame in the 1970s. That's when we get Miller v. California. And on that same day, we get Paris um, and we get, uh, oh, it's not young because that came a little bit later, but yeah. Paris and I believe it is or something like that. I'll look it up. The point of that is, is in one day we had three major decisions essentially handed down about obscenity and what our obscenity doctrine was going to look like. And then right before the decision in um, Pacifica, we had another one, Young versus American Mini Theaters, mm -hmm. which was dealing with the zoning regulations of adult entertainment and how we could regulate that type of speech. And so my point to all of that is, is in a very short amount of time, the Supreme Court was trying to give society a lot of question, answers to their questions about obscene content and decent content. And then in addition to that, just 
sex and sexual health even. That's at the same time we got our answer from Roe v. Wade even. Mm -hmm. So a lot happened culturally and legally um, around the issues of obscenity, indecency, sexual health, sexual freedom. And those decisions are still something we're reconsidering over 40 years from then. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's speaking to what's going on today and why maybe the FCC is taking this less regulatory position and saying, you know, if you're having a complaint or you're upset about something, I'm the source you come to deal with that. In terms of what we're going to punish and how we're going to punish, it seems to be very case by case at this point. Um, and to that end, I, I mentioned the Super Bowl halftime show. People were arguably upset about J-Lo and her activities and pole dancing and whatnot, which, you know, good for her. I'm just impressed she could do it. Um, but nonetheless, it's not like any fines came out of it, not, at least not yet at the very least. Um, no, what about four, about 4,000 complaints, but uh, no, no action by the FCC. Just for the record, yeah. big fan of J-Lo and Shakira's performance. Right. You know, J-Lo is my age and I wasn't able to do anything like that. I was so impressed. And then Shakira's up there. It's like, oh my gosh, I remember all <laughs> doing so up there shaking them hips how are they just not falling off at this point yeah. um and so it but it's really interesting so thinking about the fcc regulatory powers and whatnot i think again it's just trying to still figure out what it's supposed to do and as of right now it's like you know we're still gonna be the source that houses those complaints and if we find them actionable we'll do something about it but until then we're at least just very clearly the space you're supposed to go to until I guess they decide they don't want to be that policing agency anymore. Yeah. Or, or people say, um, I'm not interested in, in running home to mama <laughs> that, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just complain to CBS on my own kind of thing. Well, and I think that's a big part of it too. There's so many other sources for us to, to directly complain to people now and also on social media and there's all these other industry elements to it, you know, thinking about the digital age and, social media and such, you can directly report to YouTube or Facebook, oh, I don't like this post, I think this is offensive. So there's so many other industry elements that have this built-in practice for addressing the content that individuals don't like or don't approve of, that it's still good for us to have some form of a regulatory industry or regulatory body that's supposed to be, I guess, overlooking it. But I'm more concerned that the FCC monitors things um, like obscene and illegal content more so mm -hmm. than what makes us blush, perhaps. Yeah, you know, it's a really interesting um, component of all of this uh, to me is that we spend so much time talking about, you know, Janet Jackson in the Super Bowl, um, yeah. J-Lo and Shakira in the Super Bowl, when really, you know, this, there's just this massive industry um, trafficking in, you know, child pornography and other obscene content that the government cannot seem to get any handle on and it's just this eternal game of whack-a-mole that brings you know brings genuine harms and yet we're we seem pretty powerless or maybe maybe we have the power but, but don't know how to use it so you know i i do i do chuckle with seeing the number of complaints going in um over uh, over j-lo and shakira i was like boy if if you really knew what was out there and available to people i think you'd, i think you'd be stunned by it and I think that's part of what the Supreme Court today has really tried to address. If we start seeing since Reno versus ACLU and trying to get this idea of what is going to be the rights of obscenity and indecency online, I think essentially part of that decision also came from the Supreme Court saying like, listen, I cannot be in the business of always trying to figure out what's going to be indecent and how we deal with that. And in some ways, I give them a lot of credit because I think unbeknownst to them, they made a really great decision that mattered much later because since then, the Supreme Court and our uh, executive and legislative branches have been really trying to target those really controversial, those really dangerous types of media, the child pornography, the mm -hmm. uh, violence in media and whatnot, those more extreme types, which we need those powers saying this is illegal, we need to be policing it. Um, and for that reason, it's probably why we haven't seen an obscenity case since the 90s, really. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, we've really moved away from that being an issue, not to say that it's still not upsetting to people or worth regulation maybe at the state level, but exactly to your point, the internet is so hard to control. There's so many more people, there's so much more content, there's so many more ways to access content that essentially we have to pick and choose what we want our federal regulatory powers to be in the business of monitoring and punishing. That really is bad words on television or fancy half Bowl, Super Bowl halftime shows. You know, is that really something we need to be worried about? Probably not for them. They still have to serve as the source for us to go to them and say, I have an issue with this and that's great and wonderful. But um, if we were to make some kind of parallel between FCC 
versus Pacifica. Maybe there's just bigger pigs to yeah. fry. Bigger I think pigs in the, the parlor. Yeah. The pigs in the parlor, right? You know, I think of a fish to fry, but making the connection, you know, that famous <laughs> last line from the yeah. Supreme Court. Um, so I don't know what it is with the Supreme Court and pigs at the same way. They, they did yeah. something very similar in Butler v. Michigan, which was another decision about whether or not we could protect obscene and indecent content and how we protect children and whatnot. So I think there's this unique combination and connection between obscenity and pigs and lipstick and all those different things. I'm not really sure, but I think the Supreme Court's looking over and going, you know what, that's a little baby pig. I'm just not messing with that right now. I've got this dog over here that's some real dirty stuff, and i got to figure that out first. Um, and so I, I think that brings a lot of it to that case is very significant because it still looms. Pacifica still has power until we can maybe safely get our Supreme Court to a position that says, no, 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 it's fine. You can, you can make a decision about this because you have all these other things that the government needs to be paying attention to. And it is your analogy to whack-a-mole could not be more true, um, which is why we see these cases of obscenity and indecency and all that. It's falling off to the wayward side because there's, there's like bigger pigs to roast. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> bigger pigs to roast. All right. Well, Kyla, thank you so much. This was a great conversation. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you so much. I had a wonderful time. I could talk forever about this case. So you have to cut me off. <laughs> well, maybe we'll chat about another one down the road. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Okay. Bye-bye.